problem. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Shushin B. He is currently with the Center for Applied Energy Research, where he is a postdoc and has been so for the last one and a half years. Dr. B received his PhD from the University of Kentucky in solid state physics. He did his master's and BS work uh, at Beijing University of the People Republic, People's Republic of China. For his MS, he studied laser spectroscopy. His interest at the uh, Center for Applied Energy Research had been applying lasers to paralysis to generate catalyst particles. Today he's going to talk to us about a nanoscale catalyst produced by CO2 laser paralysis. Dr. B. Thank you. Okay, uh, in this presentation I'll we'll present our results in a synthesis, in a synthesis of nanoscale catalysts produced by CO2 laser paralysis. And the motivation of this work um, is trying to explore the possibilities of using this technique to synthesize any desired catalyst. And the motivation behind this is, uh, is known, and everybody knows that we want to make catalysts. And uh, for example, uh, carbides and nitrides, and they are known that they are good catalysts and they have similar activities so com comparable to those uh, noble metals. And plus, they have the advantages such as uh, high resistance against oxidation, against the contamination, <coughs> and they are economical. Um, so for all these uh, benefits, and if one wants to utilize them, you have to uh, obtain this catalyst in a high surface area for. And because of the uh, char characteristics of these carbides and nitrides, and for example, their high melting point, it's tough to get the uh, this catalyst in the high surface area, surface area form. Only in a few cases, such as molybdenum and tungsten and vanadium, and recently, and there are reports that uh, we can, one can generate the catalyst of these carbides and nitrides in the high surface area form. But there's no, there's no such a general tool that you can synthesize all these catalysts. Um, in this study, we are going to present you with a technique that we have found is very promising can produce all this uh, catalyst uh, in a very small nanoscale particle, and uh, which can be eventually be used as a high surface high surface area catalyst. <coughs> in this transparency, I show you here the schematics of our laser pyrolysis system. <coughs> this process was first invented by John Haggerty from MIT. And he, this technique uh, was used uh, to uh, synthesize the silicon carbides and the silicon nitride ceramic particles. And later it was used by researchers from Exxon, uh, where they use this catalyst, they use this technique to synthesize the uh, iron carbide uh, Fe3C particles. And later on there are almost nice, uh, very, very few studies that concern about this uh, technique. And uh, about two years ago, and we have uh, initiated this uh, project and explore its uh, use in the synthesis of the nanoscale catalysts. OK, um, showing in this transparency, this is our 150 watts CO2 laser coming in here. This is a six-way stainless steel cross, where you can we have a window here. And this, you have a two. Uh, window that can transmit infrared li light. The reaction zone is centered at here. And the vapors of chemical precursor was introduced through this transfer nozzle <coughs> and was shielded by argon flowing concent uh, concentrically uh, along this nozzle. And at the right beginning of our study, we have used uh, iron carbonyl as our chemical precursor, where we use ethylene as our laser absorbing gas. And this ethylene was bubbled through the iron carbonyl liquid and picked up the vapor pressure and transferred them into the center of the reaction zone. There are two points that one can use this technique to make the particle. The first
first one is you've got to have uh, volatile chemicals that can produce enough vapor into the reaction zone. Secondly, to utilize the laser, you have to have a one, at least a one, reactant gas that strongly absorbs laser energy because that's the only heating source that you're going to have in the chemical reaction in the center. And once the chemical reaction occurs and the particles form and uh, pump through this uh, the glass trap and the it over here, and here's the pump. And we have used a Teflon filter here. And for all this iron, most of the iron compounds, and normally they are magnetic, so that you can use a magnet to uh, pull these particles down to the bottom of the trap, and then this way you can prevent them from condensing on the filter. Uh, you can collect larger batch of particles without interrupting the continuous flow of the uh, entire process. And then later on we have uh, a little bit of this uh, uh, use of this technique into explore some other compounds, such as we have used uh, benzene and plus a little bit of iron carbonyl as a catalyst. And we have used uh, containing chloride. And we put all these things in here and bubble them through the interaction. Then we have produced the nanoscale carbon suit. And we have produced containing carbide and containing oxide. And the case and root L. And then this whole thing was replaced with a solid sublimation style. And like I said earlier, that it's important to have a volatile chemical vapor in the reaction zone. So uh, not, unfortunately, not all the chemicals in the world are liquids. So therefore, you have to you, uh, make another attachment over here to uh, generate vapor from the solids. So then, uh, now showing here is that sublimation cell. And our preliminary studies uh, recently have uh, made uh, a number of uh, particles of this uh, solid. A precursor, which I will show you in a minute. Okay, so let me summarize uh, the advantage of this technique. First of all, it, uh, it has a small reaction zone because of the well-defined laser beam. And this kind of small reaction zone is not easily achieved with any other existing technique. Uh, because the laser has well-defined beam, so that you can have such a small reaction zone, and which is a very crucial in synthesis, very, very small particles. Because the particle form in this reaction zone, and if you have a larger reaction zone, the particle size will simply grow larger and larger. And so this is the first point. The second one is that this entire chamber here is cold. In other words, we do not have a furnace here. And only region that is hot is that it's center, which is in the air, that does not in contact with any other thing. So therefore, you have uh, minimized uh, contamination from the chamber wall. This is uh, different from uh, many other existing oven-based techniques. And third, this is a continuous process. In other words, if you have a larger capacity of a uh, collecting mechanism, you can run this reaction for a long time and uh, collecting a large batch of particles. This is also good for many in-situ studies. And fourth, and this technique has a characteristic that is crucial, uh, that is very fast heating and cooling. Okay? Um, you can imagine that this uh, reaction gas flowing from this nozzle and uh, flash through this reaction zone and form the particles <coughs> and out, out. This is a very quick heating and cooling, which is uh, perfect for the synthesis of the metastable compounds. Um, as you all know that if you have a long enough time and those particles form, you can dissociate again at the same temperature. But when you have a, a reaction zone that is small, and you can really form the metastable uh, phases. And these argon gases over here were introduced into the chamber to protect the windows because particles may wander around. If you have one or two or three particles condense on the window, then uh, laser heating and then you can damage the uh, uh, entire chamber. So argon was int introduced for that purpose. And uh, just uh, another minor point is that this laser can also be replaced with the uh, uh, UV laser, which then you can study the photochemical reaction in here. Right <coughs> now, using CO2 laser, basically you have a thermal reaction. <laughs> This is our real apparatus. This is a 
our first generation of uh, apparatus in here is about, from here to here, is about 8 inches. And you can see uh, this is a color, this is a flame. And the particles coming out of here and collecting in this glass trap. And the reason that you can see this particle is simply because they come in, they, all these small particles like to come together and form in the larger clusters so that you can see them. Or else um, they are 200 ounce particles, you shouldn't be able to see them. Okay, the laser comes in through here and was terminated by a power detector. And right now we have our second generation um, this apparat apparatus where we have a solid sublimation cell attached here that allows you utilize both liquid and the solid precursor chemical and to generate enough uh, vapor in the reaction zone to make to produce the particles. Like I said, it is important that you have uh, at least one laser gas, uh, one reactant gas that absorbs laser energy. And used in this studies, we use ethylene and ammonia. And where you can see there are spectralized matches with uh, our emission lines, our CO2 laser. Before I show you all the evidence of these particles, and I just give you a quick summary on all the particles that we have made. And we are, with iron carbonyl plus ethylene, we produce these three phases, off iron, IP3C, and ip 763 And adding a little bit of H2S, <coughs> we found out how the particles will come out of this pyrotide. And then using ammonia, we have produced the off iron, gamma iron, and two phases of iron nitride. And then with a little bit of iron carbonyl in benzene, along with ethylene, we produce a lot of nanoscale carbons. And then using ammonia, we have found we can incorporate the nitrogen into this nanoscale carbon. So this, this is important as far as the mature side is concerned because amorphous carbon with nitrogen can be very, very hard, just as hard as diamond. So this is important in that respect. And then using titanium chloride as precursor, we produce these two phases. And recently, we further extend this technique into using tungsten carbonyl, as you all know that this is solid, it's not like iron carbonyl. So then, using this, this recombination, we have turned tungsten carbide, tungsten nitride, and tungsten oxide. And the same thing, we use molycarbonyl, we obtain the molycarbide and the molynitride. In this transparency, I show the actual refraction spectrum of our first uh, uh, of our iron carbide particles. This is the uh, of iron particles. The showing you here, the iron oxide is from the passivation on the surface, and because we handle all these particles in air during this process, so therefore, and this is not produced in the reaction zone. And as you can see here, that basically these are very pure particles, and they are single phase. And it shows that uh, this technique is able to produce particles in different chemical phases. And uh, I should mention here, this, you do not have any separation mechanism. This is a directly synthesis from the, uh, our system. And this transparency I show that while keeping the chemical phase as a single phase, and you can change the particle size of these particles and by changing the reaction conditions. And reaction conditions include the laser intensity, chamber pressure, ethylene flow rate, and uh, uh, and also the power density. And all this, you can tune the particle sizes, and which will be important to study their dependence, uh, um, their catalytic effect, um, <coughs> and, and, uh, their dependence on the particle size. And Showing here is a PM picture of our iron carbide, one of our iron carbide particles. And this particle size is on the order of 200 angstrom. And from all these TM pictures, we have obtain the particle size distribution. And it shows that it's a, there's about 50 angstrom difference. Uh, size of distribution. In, 
this transparency, we show the most power study on our particles. And it is important uh, when you characterize all these small particles, the X-ray diffraction spectrum will be broadened so severely that you may not be able to identify each individual piece. But showing this transparency, you can see that this is the most power data of bulk FE3C, and this is our nanoscale particle FE3C. And you can see the most part spectral basically stay the same and do not have significant broadening. But however, you can see the X-ray diffraction spectrum will broaden quite a bit. So this indicates that most part technique in this case um, is important to identify the chemical physics. So after we have tuned all these uh, reaction parameters of 10 these fuel phases, and we have obtained the most part spectrum for IB7C3 phase and for IB3C phase, and this compared with the literature and is uh, in a good uh, agreement. How about the uh, detailed structure of these particles? In this high resolution TEM picture, we have uh, focused on one single particle of iron carbide particles. X-ray diffraction spectrum has shown this is a single phase of iron carbide. And this is the lattice image of the iron carbide particles. By marrying the distance between these lines, you can identify that it is indeed FE3C phase. And on the surface of this particle, we have found that these coatings are parallel carbon. And we attribute that as due to the catalytic decomposition of the athlete due to this hot iron particle, iron carbon particles. And this is a, a, a large single particle. It is well known that Raman spectrum is very useful in identifying the parallel the existence of the parallel carbon. And so we have taken the Raman spectrum using the 48 argon laser line, and it shows the characteristic peaks of the paralytic carbon, and cent centered around 1375 and 1580. So this, for these two phases of uh, iron carbide particles. So this confirms the TEM observation. Now so much for the uh, iron carbide particles. And in this transparency, I I show the iron sulfide particles. And this iron sulfide particles, the experiment data was dots, and the solid lines are calculated using uh, a few Lorentz oscillators, and where the peak position and intensity represent the uh, standard powder diffraction pattern. And it shows here that our particles, again, is a single phase and pure. And these extra lines, this difference, with our data is probably due to that our powder has different X value from those uh, filed in the standard powder the uh, standard powder diffraction data. And use ammonia instead of ethylene. We show here you can generate iron nitride phases. And this is the actual diffraction spectrum. <coughs> Solid lines is calculated using the different percentage of uh, phases of gamma iron, alpha iron, Fe3, and Fe4, and, and assuming they give the similar uh, diffraction intensity of uh, each single phase. Then you can see when I change the, when I change the reaction conditions, the percentage of the alpha iron and gamma iron and Fe3 and Fe4 phases change when you, uh, it depends very uh, sensitively on the reaction parameter. So this indicates again, just like iron carbide, we will be able to produce the pure phase of Fe3N and Fe4N, which is iron nitride phases. Now let me move on another particle that we have made using this catalyst is a nanoscale carbon soot. This is a synthesized nanoscale carbon soot by paralyzing the benzene vapor in the reaction room with a little bit addic uh, additive <coughs> of uh, iron carbonyl. And showing you here is a high resolution TM picture where you can see the particle size is on the order of uh, 200 angstrom. And there's no obvious order 
And in the next uh, detail, uh, both, uh, zoom, zoom up of each individual particle, where you can see there are almost uh, no order at all. So it's a amorphous carbon particle. And we have done a lot of characterization of these particles and shows that with these con reaction conditions using power 120 watts and chamber pressure and flow rate 270 cubic centimeter, we have to use this <coughs> carbon soup and production rate is about 0.5 gram per hour and mean particle size is 20 nanometers, surface, area, uh, surface area is 50 meters square. And chemical composition basically uh, is 10 carbon and 0.01 iron. And all these things matches pretty good with the uh, uh, settling <coughs> black, where the people use uh, pyroxysis um, along with oxygen burning uh, or thermal decomposition of uh, uh, settling. In here, I should uh, uh, mention that one point that I have uh, missed is that production rate of this technique in producing all these iron carbides and iron nitride we have found the production rate is typical of 5 gram per hour and this number can be easily double, triple depending on how you design your system and they're using a different kind of uh, a nozzle. Okay, um, it is also interesting to show that uh, this nanoscale particle uh, suit, and if you heat them up in argon, and they start to become crystallized, and you see the others start to appear, and these layers is, a, is very similar to the, uh, these layers, um, other is very similar to those paralytic uh, uh, carbon. And if you further heat it up to 2850, <coughs> you see they are very other and forming the hollow hollow structure. And this provides an opportunity that later people can incorporate the other metals into the center and become protected. And like I said, that iron carbonyl serve as a catalyst. Without iron carbonyl, and I found it's difficult to we found it's difficult to synthesize this in a large amount. And <coughs> the presence of iron is shown in here by using the EDEX technique over here, very little. And actually diffraction spectrum shows typical settling black particles. And uh, if you heat them up and they become very crispy like a graphite structure. By putting ammonia and ethylene at the same time along with the benzene, I will show here is an absorbance of uh, IPAR spectrum where you can incorporate the nitrogen into the carbon and uh, indicated by this carbon and hydrogen bonding, which is uh, around the 2 to 1, 7 wave number. Next few slides, I show you the BM and actual diffraction of, uh, this is a moly nitrides. This is the moly nitride particles where we have made using uh, moly carbonyl along with the uh, uh, ethylene, uh, I'm sorry, ammonia. And uh, you can see the particles is very small and if this is not the better, this is not a good presentation of our particle and, but we have, uh, we, we can obtain the sizes by working, by, you, uh, by using other better tools and uh, they are on the order of <coughs> 7 nanometer. And the crystal phases of this nitride compound can be identified over here, and it shows there are cubic phases of uh, molybdenum 2N. And using the same constant carbonyl plus ammonia, we have been constant nitride, we are identified over here. The sharp lines is, is associated with a species of from the uh, constant carbonyl. And I should mention that this carbonyl residue is from the unreactive carbonyl, but they can be easily removed if you heat them up to 150 C. And the same similar <coughs> molecular particles of tungsten carb uh, this is molycarbide, and you see the small particles. This is for tungsten carbide, and in here, therefore, 
if you watch, there is a bigger particle here, if you just uh, glance it. But if you watch detail in each large particle, you can see small facet, which is the order is about uh, two nanometer. And that two nanometer is associated with the X-ray diffraction bro uh, peak uh, broadening, which shows in this uh, transparency. And again, we obtain multi carbides and tungsten carbides. And in here, it's almost amorphous. But when people say amorphous, normally it means that you have a larger crystalline, you have a larger particle, but you have a tremendous amount of disorder, so that's amorphous. But when this particle size is getting smaller, smaller, and smaller, and this concept will become will be becoming not that strict because because the significant reduction of the particle size also will significantly broaden the X-ray diffraction spectrum. So therefore, you should watch both X-ray diffraction and temp, uh, TEM to, uh, to identify how many small crystalline inside your particle. In this transparency, I just show you using different reaction con conditions, you can again tune the uh, uh, crystalline size of the constant carbide particles. And as far as uh, carbon, where is the carbon come from? We have came, come to conclusion that carbon is coming from the dissociation, the dissociation of ethylene, and carbonyl is not involved. And this is another evidence of that is when we do the Raman spectrum on tungsten nitride and tungsten carbon, uh, tungsten carbide. This is a parallel to the carbon peak associated with the. This is the Raman spectrum of the parallel carbon peak. And <coughs> here, this is a tungsten nitride where you do not see the presence of the carbon. That indicates that CO coming off the iron, uh, tungsten carbonyl is not involved in the reaction, and carbon comes from the ethylene. And this is a comparison of Raman spectrum of carbon on iron and the tungsten carbide, on iron carbide and tungsten carbide. And it shows that in the, in the case of iron, um, the disorder induced the Raman diffraction uh, peak is higher than the case of tungsten. And this indicates in the case of tungsten, you have a more sp2 bond because this peak is higher than that. Finally, let me give you uh, a short summary. We have talked about the metals, which is upper iron carbides, nitrides, sulfides, and now next few slides show you the oxides. By putting oxygen along with this uh, reaction, uh, re reacting gases, you can see the carbide phase is gone, and you obtain pure, almost pure. In this case, there is a peak in here, uh, Fe three or four magnetized particles. And in the case of tungsten, this is a uh, using tungsten carbonyl, and with oxygen. Then you obtain WO3, tungsten oxide particles. And from the X-ray diffraction broadening here, you can estimate the crystalline size is, on, is always on the order of 100 angstrom. And this is a TEM spectrum of these tungsten oxide particles. And those small ones, we can marry their particle size is in good agreement with X-ray diffraction. And those larger ones, and if you watch them closely, and they are each a cluster of us, all these small ones. And another oxide that we have produced is a titanium oxide, which shows here. And this is a um, production with oxygen, ethylene, and titanium chloride. You obtain a mixture. And by however, each individual peak is associated with containing carbide, containing oxide, rutile, and this. When you heat them up, and you obtain only rutile. This is a um, this is understandable because the anatase is not stable at high temperature, and they come all convert to a rutile. Finally, let me conclude. We have produced a variety of nanoscale catalysts to particles using CO2 laser pyrolysis technique including metals, carbide, sulfide, nitride, and, and oxides. We have shown that chemical phase and particle size of the catalyst can be controlled by choosing appropriate reaction parameters. 
and uh, we have achieved a production rate up to five grams per hour. And finally, we have demonstrated that this technique is very promising in the synthesis of any desired nanoscale pellet or particles. And let me thank those people in the Center for Applied Energy Research for the, their assistance in the characterization of the uh, of all these nanoscale uh, particles. And finally, I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Bert Davis for very helpful discussions. Thank you for your attention. We do have a few minutes for a few questions. A question about you have your laser set up and then you have a detector. Can you estimate by the flux of your laser what the temperature of your reaction zone is? Yeah, and uh, basically um, using acetylene as your absorber and uh, you always have uh, on the order of uh, 1200 C and if you have 100 watts input. And of course that will fluster. And it's not a tribute to vary the temperature accurately in that small reaction zone. So you always have this deposit of the particles and uh, absorbing the laser directly by the thermal copper one. And you can control your flow into your reactor zone. Does your distribution or your particle or your products vary depending on your flow rate? Uh, oh, uh, you mean the uh, per, uh, per production rate? Right, I mean, yes, yeah, as far as how fast you pump the ethylene through your reactor zone. Yes, you yes. vary the nature of your product. Right, this is uh, basically where the art comes in, that you have to match all these parameters proportionally so that you can obtain <coughs> the single phase and at the same time you increase your production rate. You can not only just enlarge the nozzle without in increasing the flow of the gas. And uh, all these things will have to be matched uh, well so that you can obtain a single phase. How much material do you make in one of your experiments? Okay, uh, let me give you a ball ballpark uh, example. For the nanoscale uh, iron carbide, right now our system can generate four to five grams per hour continuously. In other words, you can run uh, two hours, you up to 10, 10, 10 grams. But for the land scale carbon, so the carbon itself is life, you produce 0.5 grams. For the tungsten stuff, and uh, right now we just uh, we produce uh, roughly about uh, 400 milligram per hour. And that is because we have used a small nozzle as a preliminary test. Yeah. You said uh, carbon suit can be synthesized using this technique. Uh, is there any possibility of synthesizing fuller in this? Uh, yes, uh, that's uh, Peter's uh, idea. And he, uh, at the beginning, and he has tried to uh, utilize this technique and to produce all these exotic, uh, newly discovered uh, buckyballs. And right now, we are just we have submitted this uh, suit to somewhere to uh, use a mass spec to and see if there are any existing of the buckyball. Yeah. Just from a mechanical standpoint, uh, <coughs> I have an orientation question for you. I would assume the reason that you've got upflow is stability of your flames. Uh, have you thought about running your reactor upside down? Uh, and there is one group, probably the only one group that is uh, using this technique to do this kind of study is in Italy. And their group use upside down. Yes, indeed, the uh, flame will be point, point down. Sure. It's just a <coughs> Almost depending on the, uh, how the gas is, uh, is, uh, is flowing. Yeah, that's uh, another opinion similar. Well, thank you very much.